We will see great tribulation, but we are not appointed to the wrath of God. They're two different things. When the wrath of God falls on this earth, that we will not be there for the wrath of God. We are not appointed to wrath, but we are appointed to tribulation. Praise the Lord. You know, the Lord said, I will restore the years that the canker worm and the caterpillar have eaten. Yeah. <laughs> True. Well, did you sleep well last night? Do you have any dreams? Some had some dreams. Well, it's good. Hallelujah. Just a few things before I get into my message, in case I forget. Okay. Um, Australia is going to come under pressure when the economic, this next economic collapse occurs. You, um, Europe is going to be in a very difficult way. And there's going to be a lot of pressure on Australia to supply funds to Europe. Um, Australian banks are in pretty good shape compared to the rest of the world. However, when this whole thing goes down, there's going to be a lot of pressure on Australia to supply funds to, to, to prop up some of the European banks. When that happens, you must pray that that does not happen, that the government does not do that. Because Australia is scheduled in God as a place of refuge in the end times. And it's going to happen. When you see that happen in the news, you need to start to pray that the Australian government does not sanction that and, and pressurize the uh, Australian banks to supply funds to Europe. It's not in the mind or the will of God. And if they do, it will be, have consequences for um, Australia. So that's, that's important to understand that. Okay, so just keep that in the back of your mind over the next year or two, that's going to happen. And uh, you need to be aware of it. Hallelujah. In the last, the last month, I've had two visitations from Joseph. Um, I, I won't go into it all at this point, but one of the things he said to me he was that we have seven years before it will become difficult, almost impossible, to buy or sell. We have a seven-year window. And um, after that, well, you know the story, don't you? So just be aware of that, because that requires some planning. It takes, it's going to require some financial strategies and uh, planning, and you need to... Um, be aware and seek the Lord as to, you know, how do you prepare for that? How does the church prepare for that? How do individuals prepare for that? But we have a window of opportunity. And um, during this next seven-year window, a lot of people will, you know, come to the Lord. You know, there'll be a seven-year window. And um, so it's important to... In the midst of the chaos, there's going to be massive harvest coming in, and that's the wonderful part of it. And, um, you know, it's going to be difficult. The times will be difficult. But let me just say something. We need to prepare for that. But God is not into hoarding. You can stack up all the food you want, but if you've got it and your neighbor doesn't have it, you're in big trouble. Because the times of lawlessness are coming. And I want to tell you something. If you give to feed your neighbors and lead them to the Lord, God will miraculously multiply your food. Amen. You need to believe that. You need to keep it, keep it in the back of your mind. It's good to store up stuff, you know, tin the stuff and all that. But he's, it's for, not for us. It's for the, our neighbors. And if we give it away... He will multiply it for us. There are going to be Christian storehouses where they'll empty out once a week and the next week they'll be <coughs> miraculously supplied again. The warehouse will be full. This is going to become an incredible evangelistic tool. Powerful evangelistic tool. And so, this is some exciting days ahead of us. And he that endures 
to the end shall be saved. Amen. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Be glad then, you children of Zion, and rejoice in the Lord your God, for he has given you the former rain moderately, and he's given you the latter rain, the former rain and the latter rain in one month. You know, in Israel, um, they tell us that the former rain is a, it's a, just a gentle rain that moistens up the land. You know, the former rain, the beginning of the year, the beginning of the season. But at the end, they tell us that the end, the rain at the end of the year, which finally is just before the bringing in of the harvest, is seven times greater than the former rain. That's in the natural, physical, natural realm in Israel. That's how it works. The, and um, the meteorology department tell you that. The former rain, but the latter rain is seven times greater. See, we're going to have seven times more than the early church had. Can you imagine that? Seven times more. Hallelujah. I give you the former and the latter rain in one month, and your threshing floor shall be full of wheat. They'll be full. The harvest will come in. Your know, wheat are people, you know, they'll come into the kingdom of God. And I will restore to you the years that the canker worm, the caterpillar, hallelujah. It's possible for you to stop aging. It really is. It really is. Hallelujah. You know, remember Methuselah? How old did he live? 900 and something years. His name means, when he is dead, it will come. That's the literal meaning of his name. When, they, when Enoch saw that, he saw something. Enoch saw the coming flood, and he named him, when you are dead, it will come. And so God said, no, I'll give him a few more years. In his mercy and his grace, give him another 20 years. Give him another 100 years. And he's getting up to 900 now. That's the mercy and the grace of God. When he is dead, it will come. But you see, there's no more time to delay any longer. God spoke to me earlier this year and said, no more. There will be no more delays. There's been delays in the grace and the mercy of God. There was a two-year delay a while back. That's over. God gives us more time. That's the grace and goodness of God. But there are no more delays now. And so we live in, in an ex, exciting time. He said, I'm going to restore. God also said, I will restore both the fig tree and the vine together. The fig tree is Israel. You see them being restored in the natural. And the vine is the church being restored physically together. And that for a little while, I want to talk to you about, you know, the coming blood moons. There's another set of blood moons coming, right? Feast of Tabernacles this year. And um, it's important, you know, that we understand what this means and, and, and where this is going to take us and what it means and how we to prepare for that, and just so we have a better understanding of it, you know? In Hebrews chapter 12, it says, one more time I'm going to shake, just one more time. I'm removing those things that are shaken, of things that are made, natural things. He's going to shake everything in the church that's been of man and shake it down. Some of the large, large churches around the world are going to completely disappear. And that's not negative. It's just God dealing with the church. Everything that's not built on kingdom principles is going to be shaken down. Everything that is man-made will be removed until what is left. And uh, the church as we know it now will come down to a smaller thing, not necessarily in numbers, but in application around the world, but it would be far more glorious. And then there'll be another shaking, and it'll be more glorious again. Until the final state, the church will be such a magnificent thing in the earth that it will be the, the desire of all nations. 
God's going to do that, but it's going to take some shaking to take this whole thing down. And uh, once, for thus saith the Lord, yet once in a little while, I will shake the heavens and the earth and the sea and the dry land. Then the result of that is in the next, in verse 9, then the glory of this latter house shall be greater than the former. The glory of this latter house, latter church will be greater than the early church. I don't want to go back to the early church. There's something far greater than the early church. Seven times greater. Oh. See, Jesus clearly told us that storms are coming. If you, somebody, some other doctrines is telling you that we're not going to go through difficult times, that is not of God. That's not what Jesus said. Jesus said, the storms are coming. And he said, if you build your house upon the sand, it'll fall. He said, if you build it on the rock, you'll survive what the days that lie ahead. And he was talking about the, the teaching and the sayings of Jesus. You know, in Matthew seven twenty four, Whosoever heareth my sayings and doeth them, I will like him unto a wise man who built his house upon the rock. The rain descended, the floods came, the winds blew and beat upon it, but it didn't fall because it was founded on the rock, the teachings of Jesus. And everyone that heareth these saints of mine and doth not do them shall be likened to a foolish man built on his house and upon the sand. And the rain descend, the floods came, the winds blew, and the house fell. And great was the fall of it. Jesus is talking to Christians. You know, he's not talking to the unsaved here. He that heareth my sayings of mine, he said, and doeth them, I liken unto a man. This house is you. There's some difficult times coming. This world is going to be shaken like, you know, we see stuff that's happening in the nations around the world today. That, that is just chicken feed to what's coming. We're going to live in a very dangerous world. But Psalm 91 comes into play. It shall not come near you. Only with your eyes shall you see what's taking place. He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. He shall say, the Lord is my rock, my refuge. The arrow that flieth by day, missiles. A thousand shall fall at your side. And you'll, only, you'll see it and behold it with your eyes, but it shall not come near you. Hallelujah. Amen. You know, in 1970, 73, I think it was, um, the Lord gave me a vision of, of Japan, an earthquake in Japan. And it was um, 9.1 on the Richter scale, and I shared it with my church. Which, that's a long time ago, 90s, early 1970s. That really dates me right back, <laughs> you know. And I said, you know, this earthquake, I saw the stock exchange in, in Tokyo tom completely demolished in an earthquake, which had a rippling effect around the world as well. And the Lord said to me, when you see this, and that, that the, the earthquake would be on uh, 9.1. The last earthquake in Japan was registered at 9.1 on the Richter scale. And he said, when you see this, it's time to live in Psalm 91. That's where we are today. There are going to be more earthquakes in Japan. But there's going to be revival in Japan too. You know, but this is a day, you know, in which we are living in. And we were talking about a kingdom culture yesterday, the Beatitudes, the beautiful attitudes. You know the Beatitudes? If they compel you to go one mile, go two. That's a kingdom culture. Read through them all. Remember Ruth, not Ruth, Esther. Sadhu talked about it yesterday. You know, she's six months with drenched in all kinds of perfumes you can imagine. And then another six months drenched in all kinds of stuff. When she came out, she was smelling right. You know what I'm saying? 
How do you smell? Because who you are and what you emanate is a smell. You're all smelling today. <laughs> it's true. That is true. Put your old on or not, you're still smelling. You can smell good or you can smell bad. Oh. <laughs> We might touch on that later. We're getting carried away. Anyway, shakings, birth pangs, cataclysmic changes are right on our doorstep. Signs in the heavens. We need to know the importance of signs and seasons and what they mean to us today. These are given to us by God to point out what he's doing next, what he's taking us. There are signposts down the way. And if we miss these signs... We can fall so far behind, we will not be able to catch up. That's the danger of it. 2014, we've come to a point where profound changes in the world, in politics, in the economies of the world, in the church, are taking place. It's affecting the whole realm. And uh, the next seven years are going to be some of the most important years that the church has ever seen. I'm not saying, and I didn't say just for the tape, that Jesus is coming back in seven years, all right? It's on YouTube, I didn't say that. <laughs> We've got seven years to prepare, Amen. you know. Signs in the heavens. On Friday, the 13th of January this year, I awoke early in the morning with a loud voice saying, when he is dead, it will come. And I thought, what? And I looked at my wife. She's dead to the world. <laughs> and I thought, but it was a male voice anyway. When he is dead, it will come. And I sat, lay there in bed, Lord, is Billy Graham going to die? Who's going to die? What is this? And the Lord said, get up and turn the news on. And I thought, oh, yeah, it's about half past five, six in the morning. I said, okay. The news came on, Ariel Sharon is at the point of dying. And I thought, what? Ariel Sharon was a former prime minister, uh, a former prime minister of Israel. He was a military commander, and he died on January 11th at the age of 85. He'd been in a coma since 2006, eight years in a coma. His stroke incapacitated him at the height of his political power. You know, Sharon led Israel in winning four Israeli wars. And uh, he was a great general. Controversial figure, but nevertheless, he was a great general. And he, God kept him alive as a sign to this year. When he is dead, it will come. And I thought, well, you know, what is coming? I waited on the Lord, you know, to speak to me about this. And I clearly heard him say, Ariel Sharon's death was a prophetic milestone and a linchpin that will bring change in Israel and the world. And I thought about that for a long time, you know. A milestone means, you know, the dictionary states a milestone and its relevance is that uh, it's an important event in a person's career or in the history of a nation or a turning point. A milestone, a linchpin. A linchpin is, in, you know, it's a pin that's inserted into an axle to keep the wheel on. And uh, it's a central, a linchpin is a central cohesive support for stability. You know, let me just say, a lot of churches, even a lot of big churches who are built on man, are gonna, the wheels are going to fall off. Because everything that can be shaken, everything that's built by a man is going to be shaken down. Not just in the world, but in the church. So, Ariel Sharon d died eight years. Eight is the beginning, the new beginning. It always speaks of a new beginning. I cannot overemphasize how important the years this year and next year are. 2014 
and 2015, how important those next two years are. We're going to see massive changes take place. You know, astronomy is the science of studying the movement and positions of the stars and planets. Astrology is different. The astrology involve, involves the worship of stars. It's an occult practice. You know, pagans seek guidance from their lives. It's a pagan practice. It's recorded in, you know, Exodus 24, 14, and Romans 1, 20. It talks about how these pagans worship that. We're not talking about astrology today, right? That's not what we're talking about. But God clearly, very clearly, said that the stars and the planets have a voice and they can communicate with us. That's, you know, and they said there'll be signs in the sun and the moon and the stars. And, uh, and so, you know, it's important to understand. Psalm 19, the heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament showeth forth its handiwork. Day unto day they speak to us. They utter speech. And night unto the night they reveal knowledge to us. There, la there is no speech no language where their voice is not heard. So every nation in the world can see what God is saying. Their line has gone out throughout the whole earth and their words to the ends of the world. The heavens declare the glory of God and showeth forth his handiwork and day unto day they speak to us. So, Understanding that, you know, it's very, very important. Jesus said in Luke 21, 25, There shall be signs in the sun and in the moon and in the stars and upon the earth, distress of nations with perplexity of sea and waves roaring. See, that's happening today. We're in a phase now of blood moons. At the same time, we see distress among nations all over the world now. ISIS arising. And all over the world, Russia arising again. Men's hearts then, he said, failing them for fear, looking at those things which are coming. But it says, but after these things, he said, after this, you shall see the Son of Man coming in his glory back to this earth. See, we're right in that period of time. And it's important we understand that. The book of Revelation speaks a little about this, where Revelation 8 and verse 8 says, There was, it were, a great mountain of fire burning was cast into the sea. What is that? You know, if you see a meteor coming in, it's like a star or a mountain falling with fire into the earth. This hit the, this hit the, Atlantic, this hit the Pacific Ocean because it said a third of the seas were polluted by that. And the Pacific Ocean covers a third of the sea around the world. It's a third volume in volume. And that's an American coast, and it reaches us here. The Pacific Ocean says a third, and there fell a great star from heaven burning like a lamp, and it fell on a third part of the sea in the rivers. And the name of it was called Wormwood because it poisoned the waters. See, that's where we're living, right now. You know, in February 2013, we saw an incredible event when a 60-foot wide rock weighing 1,000 tons crashed through the Earth's atmosphere over Russia. Remember that? Luckily, it exploded in the atmosphere, not on the ground. But, you know, it came in at over 50,000 miles per hour. Imagine it, 1,000 tons. NASA estimated the energy released by this meteor as it exploded was 30 times that of the Hiroshima nuclear bomb that was dropped on Hiroshima, 30 times greater. Just as well, it was way up in the atmosphere. If that had gotten through, Russia would be no more. See, it was right there. What was God saying? He said, I'll show you stars, stars falling. I'll show you signs in the heavens and the earth. I looked at this and I said, look, what are you saying? He said, the Russian bear is coming out of hibernation. 
and we've seen that. Distress of nations all around us. Neither Russian, Russian, Putin was wanting to re-establish the whole glory of the Russian Empire and take back all of those nations that were in the old Russian Empire. He won't be able to do it all, but he's trying to do it. There'll be wonders in heaven, signs on the earth belief, blood and fire. Joel said, Joel 3.22.30 rather, I will show you wonders in heaven and earth, blood and fire and smoke, and the sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon before that great and terrible day of the Lord. Let me just tell you something, just to be clear. We will see great tribulation, but we are not appointed to the wrath of God. Amen. They're two different things. When the wrath of God falls on this earth, that we will not be there for the wrath of God. We are not appointed to wrath, but we are appointed to tribulation. There's a difference, a real big difference. So, hallelujah. Both Prophet Joel and Jesus said that we would see blood moons or red moons, colored moons. The blood moons occurs during the total lunar eclipse and turns color red. Now, we've seen blood moons before, right? But when blood moons fall, when four of them fall on feast days, four feast days, you know, the feast days in Israel from Passover, Pentecost, right through to Tabernacle, when they fall on four feast days in the same one or two year period, it's that year period between, it's extremely rare. The chances of that happening are millions and upon millions to one. <laughs> but we are seeing it. We've seen it in history. And the scary thing is <laughs> we've seen it happening this year and it happens again next year all on feast days in Israel. Hey, come on. God's saying something, right? You can't just brush this away and say it's coincidence. The history of blood moons is really important, very interesting. I can't get right back, but I can get back to 1433 when the first tet tetrad of four blood moons occurred on Passover and the Feast of Tabernacles was in 1493. There was a total solar eclipse on September the 4th in 1493, one day before the blood moons on the Feast of Tabernacles. What happened then? What happened back way then, you know? Well, what happened historically during that time? Well, King Ferdinand and Queen Isabella of Spain were the instigators of the Spanish Inquisition, which was one of the worst of the Inquisition period. The torture through that time was unspeakable. I mean, they went to levels which were unbelievable. And it was, of course, it was the, it was the Jews in Spain were, were under this inquisition, primarily. It was a brutal inquisition. And some of the worst atrocities and, and acts and torture in history. But it issued, it, 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 that, that those blood moons heralded a coming reformation that would sweep the whole of Europe. It's interesting, you know, most of these Jews that didn't die in this Inquisition were expelled and found refuge in America. America in those days was a fledgling nation, very fledgling nation. And um, God's blessing and financial prosperity lifted off Spain and the Jewish people and was transferred to America. At the same time, the Spanish were invading South America. The Spanish went to South America in search of gold. And those nations have had poverty ever since. The Pilgrim Fathers went to America in search of God. And God blessed America financially ever since. You got it? These are not coincidences. You know? The Spanish went to South America, plundering, 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 went in search of gold, 
Most of the Spanish, most of the South American nations today live in poverty. Argentina is a little exception, but Argentina is in really big trouble financially. These things are not coincidence. Oh, the world is changing. The next four blood moons, which I can get some record of at least, it's 1949-1950. Heard on feast days. Very rare. What happened? What happened? 1948, 1949, what happened? 1949, 50, April the 13th, 1949, Passover, blood moons. October 7th, tabernacles, blood moons. Right through those years into 1950. Now what changes took place? See, God had said this in Ezekiel 36, 24, I will take you from among the heathen and I will gather you out of all of the countries, talking about the Jewish people, and I'll bring you to your own land. Now God said this. This is not a political thing. This is what God intended. I'll bring you into your own land. And we know in 1948, Israel was declared a nation. Although it was in motion before then, but in 1948, she was declared a nation. And the Israeli flag, you know, and this was a miracle after being expelled, you know, by Titus when he sacked Jerusalem, raised it to the ground. All those years go by, and suddenly God said, My word, which was spoken by Ezekiel and other prophets, I will now fulfill, and you'll become a nation. I'll give you the land. That's a momentous thing. That changed the world. It changed the politics of the world. It changed everything. But what happened in the church? The 1948 move of God was an incredible move of God. Incredible move of God. And God raised up men like Billy Graham, Teal Osborne, Oral Roberts, hundreds of them. I can't name them all. Which went forth with... You know, signs and wonders, evangelism, like the world had never seen for a long, long time. God raised these men up right on that brink. There's always a raising up of ministries at periods like this. You know, and that was an incredible move of God. William Branham. Now, I know a lot of people have a down or on William Branham, but I want to tell you something. William Branham was an incredible man of God. And he didn't say that he was Elijah. That's on record. It was his followers who said that. He said that he wasn't Elijah. It's on tape. You know, we run some of these men's down because of rumors. A. A. Allen, remember some of you read about A. A. Allen? Assemblies of God in America said he was a drunkard and he was framed by the Assemblies of God. I've spoken to his granddaughter just a few months back in, in Lancaster. He was framed because the semblance of God could not handle the kind of ministry that he had and the miracles that were occurring. Let's not be naive, eh? These were great men of God. And they were raised up at this time. Who is God going to raise up this year and next year and bring them into prominence around the world? And a great ministry is... They're all there for the taking because the time and the season is now. If you seek the Lord with all of your heart, you press into God, it's a time for raising up ministries. That's how Billy Graham was raised up. Teal Osborne was raised up. Teal Osborne came back from India and said, I can't reach India because there are no signs and wonders. I can't tell them my God is greater than their God because we have no miracles. So he came home disillusioned. And God before God said, God, I cannot be a missionary unless I can demonstrate your life and power. God appeared to him one day at the end of his bed, commissioned him. I saw a, a movie at Teal Osborne. Somewhere, it was somewhere in the Caribbean, or further south. And he was in a great outdoor stadium, and he called all the witch doctors up onto the platform. Then he called people who were totally blind. Some of them no eyeballs at all. Call them up. There's a whole row of them. 
Now he said to the witch doctors, you pray for them and we'll see who is the real God. He had a lot of courage, you know. <laughs> so they go for 20 minutes doing their thing, the mumbo jumbo and all that kind of stuff. 20 minutes, he said, stop. They're still all blind. This is what Thiel Osborne did. He walked like this. He said, in the name of the Lord, he touched them all on the head. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, receive your sight. The whole row received their sight. N new eyeballs. These were the kind of guys. Thiel Osborne was one that inspired me in the early days, I tell you. He's great, you know, and he's just gone home. The only one left is Billy Graham. You know, T.L. Osborne, he, his wife had gone and his wife had died and he was at home and he was saying, Lord, I want to go home. And I want to go home with my wife on Valentine's Day. I want to be with her. So he called all the family together. Valentine came, Valentine's Day came around. They sat down and he told them that he was going home. And they sat around in the lounge in his home, and they just began to pray. And they realized that T.L. wasn't talking. He'd gone. Just like that. Second to last one. It's just Billy Graham left now. End of an era, and he will go very quickly. Not that we wish that, but it's time. Let me tell you something. The Lord showed me this. It's all right, I've got another hour yet. <laughs> the Lord showed me this, that when T.L. TL died and Billy Graham dies, their mantles will be combined and made available to the body of Christ. And I believe in this next phase we're coming into now, Billy Graham will go home. You see, Billy Graham walked in incredible integrity where a lot of the Pentecostals weren't walking in integrity. T.L. Osborne walked, moved in incredible signs and wonders. You put those two mantles together, man, you've got a powerful force. It's coming. It's coming. Those mantles are going to become available, but you're going to bring them together, join them as one. The integrity of Billy Graham and the signs and wonders of T.L. Osborne. Hallelujah. Amen. Oh, these blood moons are good, you know. <laughs> They're giving us an opportunity. He said, I've chosen Jerusalem. Now, 948 move of God was fantastic. It moved on, others moved on. And then God said, all right, I've given you the land, but I've chosen Jerusalem. I thought, okay. So... Next four blood moons were in 1967, 1968. To Chronicles 6 and verse 6, Behold, I have chosen Jerusalem that my name might be there. Four blood moons occurred, again, on feast days. And in Israel, the six-day war happened. And Jerusalem came back into Israeli hands. Incredible. Changed the world again. But also... Something happened in the church. Oh, the Six-Day War was, you know, it was wonderful. Jerusalem was restored back into Israeli hands, and God poured out his spirit on the church in an incredible way. Charismatic moves was an incredible move of God. I know that because my wife and I were right in the midst of it. And it was glorious, you know. And it, it's, it was an incredible, incredible move of God. Jerusalem came back. I was flying into America a couple of years ago, uh, two, three years ago, and um, when I got up, got off the plane, and was, and I was walking off, off the plane, I noticed my wedding ring had gone. And I thought, no, my wife will kill me. <laughs> <laughs> my wedding ring. Went back, looked for it, couldn't find my wedding, so I thought, all right, Lord. And, my, and I was, got into my hotel room in LA, and I thought, well, Lord, what is this about? He said, tell America. If their government divides, 
Jerusalem, I will divorce them. And I thought, why me? <laughs> Get somebody else to tell them this, you know. See, God has desired Jerusalem. That's what he said there. It's not a political thing, it's God's choice. And so, the charismatic move. Oh, I could tell you some tales from the charismatic move. Unbelievable stuff. It was a great move of God. Many of you wouldn't know anything about that because you're not old enough. Some of you are old enough to know and remember the charismatic move, both in America, Australia, New Zealand. And, you know, church growth went through the roof. And Derek Prince came on the scene. He brought casting demons out of Christians. <laughs> Glory to God. <laughs> Cast some demons out of my church elders and left me with it. <laughs> you, know, you know, oh, I don't know how I got into this. <laughs> you know... Your spirit is pure before the Lord, but the areas of your soul, if they're not clean, demons can inhabit. Even though you are a Christian, demons can inhabit. If you've got an, an unclean mind, demons will inhabit. You know, demons are, can cause sicknesses, and they need to be cast out of the physical body for that sickness to be healed. Some kinds of blindness are called by spirits of blindness, spirits of deafness, and they lodge in the physical body. You know, even if Christians, they lodge in the physical body until they're cast out. The Bible is full of that. So, you know, that whole theology conflict came, Christians can't have demons. Well, talk to my... <laughs> Not true. In the area of the soul, you can have, you know, possession of certain areas of your soul. Uh, need casting out. Sicknesses, some sicknesses are caused by demons, spirits of affliction, you know. Jesus had this woman who had been bent over for 38 years and it was a spirit, cast it out and she straight. Glory to God. That was a wonderful move of God. And, you know, another history-making event in Israel. Jerusalem restored back in Israeli hands. Then it was a wonderful time. The next four blood moons were in 2014, which we've just had. Uh, some early in Passover, we had this year, 15th. Tabernacles this year on October the 8th. Wow. And the thing is, there are not going to be any more blood moons for hundreds of years. So this is the last. Out of all history, it stops here with this generation. There's not going to be blood moons on these feast days for hundreds of years. Wow. You've got to be significant, right? Yeah. And you're alive now in this generation. You know? And the fact that these all occurred on feast days is incredible. What can we expect to happen? Well, every time this has happened, God raised up ministries as signs significant of the age in which we would do We're coming in this year, and next year will be the end of the blood moons, right? Is God going to raise you up? He raised Billy Graham up because they were seeking God. Simple as that. They didn't know much about what was about to happen. Taylor Osborne was the same. Oral Roberts was the same. All of these guys, William Branham was the same. Critical ministries. Now, how many of you is God going to say, okay, this is your day? Back there, it was just a few. There's going to be many hundreds and hundreds of us raised up. Amen. Taking us to another level in God. Another level of signs and wonders like we've not dreamt of. See, God's going to take this whole thing to another level. We're going to see people who have no arms, we're going to see them grow back out. Amen. For signs and wonders to lead them to the Lord and because of the kindness of God. 
You're going to see Down syndromes. Kids totally restored instantaneously. Features change, everything. You're going to see incredible miracles happen. Are you going to be a part of that? Come on. Young people. You don't have to be my age. Thank God. <laughs> Look. Teenagers, young people, kids in your 20s, 30s. This is your day. Amen. Your sons and your daughters shall see visions. Your sons and your daughters shall catch the flame. Go forth like an army. God's going to bring an army of kids into the kingdom of God as well. Heal them. As, and heal them and deliver them from the whole demonic influence that this world has over them. And because they're unchurched, they'll believe anything we tell them. If we say you can cast out demons, they will believe it. You know, we've got a lot of stuff to unload off us from church. But they won't have it. That's a Harry Potter generation. <laughs> they believe it. You know? Oh, this is your day. Yes, sir. It's your day. It's your day. The Spirit of God is going to sweep through Asia like you've never seen before. It's like there's a shift occurring, you know, like from Jerusalem, went out, the uttermost parts of the earth, from America, the shift is returning back through Asia, back through into Israel. There's going to be a lot of persecution in Asia, but it's okay. Look, it's okay if you die. I, yeah, martyrdom is a credible privilege. And I want to tell you, I've seen aspects of martyrdom. I've seen people martyred in the spirit. Of God took me to a place where bullets were this close from this girl's head. And they're coming in a, you know, automatic weapons fire. And her spirit came out of her body. Amen. Just before those bullets hit her. And she joined the army of the Lord on the earth. Amen. Satan can't win. The more he martyrs, the more join the army. Amen. This is the... You see, the Islamic thing is the counterfeit suicide bomber. You know, death is not a bad thing. You know, some of you people are old enough. You're old now, and you'll probably die over the next seven years because you're that age, right? Yeah. <laughs> Don't look at me like that. That's just life, right? But look, have a glorious death. Go out thanking God, praising God. You know, death is not always cracked down to be. It's something glorious. Absent from the body, present with the Lord. But joining the army of God in the earth, riding with the... the we're going to have a mix of heavenly saints and earthly saints in this army. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I saw this. I saw this. I was taken to, to, to this army. I was watching this army of the Lord, and I was a part of it, sitting on a horse, a white horse. There was an army of the Lord, a lot of teenagers, a lot of young people in the 20s, um, some walking, and we're heading towards an Islamic city. And um, as we got close to it, you could hear automatic weapons fire. So the whole, and the Lord was with us, the whole army stopped. Just stopped. And I thought, oh, what happens next? And then the Lord said, I need a martyr. And these kids said, let me go, let me go, let me go, let me go. And I thought, these kids are crazy. Let me go. <laughs> and I thought, well. And then the Lord said, I'm not good with teenagers, ages, but pointed at this girl. She looked about 20, 20 something. Did you go? And so the army had just stopped. And she started to sing and dance and start to run towards the city ahead of the army. The army was still stopped. 
and that she was dancing and singing and running towards the city. And then I heard weapons fire. You know, that's the familiar sound of automatic weapon. And I saw a cluster of bullets. Now, it all came in slow motion now and close up. The girl was here coming towards the city. This cluster of bullets were coming towards her. About there, her spirit came out of her body. A bullet hit her body, she fell to the ground. But her spirit came out of the body. When that happened, uh, a, like a flash of light began to roll towards the city. I saw it hit the walls of the city, go into the city. Then I was inside of the city looking at the people. And scales started to fall off their eyes as this wave went through the entire city. And I heard, Jesus is the true Son of God. Jesus is the true Son of God. The whole city came to the Lord. Then the Lord said, go. I looked over on a horse and my daughter was sitting on one of the horses. We'd gone to the Lord some time before. And I thought, wow, and she just waved at me. The army of heaven, army of the earth are going to go forth together. Martyrdom is an incredibly powerful weapon against the enemy. Gloriously powerful weapon. These are the days in which we're living in. It's going to get the heart out there. Some will lose their lives. And that's okay. That's okay. You don't have many years to live anywhere now on the earth, so it's okay. It's a weapon. How would you like God to choose you as a weapon to take a city? Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah.